Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, okay, thanks, Steve. Yep. Okay, we try, we try. Okay, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Moses. Uh, glad to see all of you here. Yeah, the last time I came here, like I told Steve, is like way back in 2018, way back uh, before COVID even happened. So a uh, little bit of introduction about me. I am a developer who actually uh, learned infrastructure. And then um, in my previous job, I actually worked as a system administrator to install ERP projects in, uh, in a data center. So it, I find it weird that you know, I actually start off at a high point now, going low and more low end. So, um, so there are sometimes people ask, uh, me question what's the difference between uh, on-premise and on cloud so I always like to use the mute analogy because I actually borrowed this from someone in GovTech say what's the difference is if you are on premises you actually take a bucket go to the milk farm go to the cloud farm and actually squeeze the milk out and then you drink whereas for cloud right is you just go to the supermarket and then you just drink just you know five dollars take one carton just drink milk so that's cloud for you so, I have a situation, it's something like a Marvel What If situation. <laughs> so, as you know, we are developers, we always have uh, UAT, Dev, UAT, and production environment. So, we have this What If environment, is what if your UAT is Amazon, AWS Cloud, but your production is actually an on-premise server. So, it's very strange and it's actually very frustrating because we all love the cloud right so why oh why we still have to sometimes work on premise so you see all the benefits we all know all right and we still need to go on premise so i just give you a bit of the context of the project that we used to work on the reason why they had to be on premise is because the law says so the governance says so you know, it's like you tell them, well, AWS is a lot of features, but they say, nope, nope, no patient, no data should be on the cloud. And, okay, fine. So I thought maybe I can, you know, buy two sets of hardware, one for the on-premise and one for my UAT, probably in Tata Consultancy, data center or something like that. But unfortunately, you may not have the budget because it's very expensive to buy two sets of servers to put in. And the customer, the main authentication tools is actually on-premise, it's not on cloud, it's not IAM, but an on-premise AD, for example. So the situation is you are a system integrator trying to integrate a few enterprise graded uh, software on, uh, on, on actually a rack of servers. So these are some of the samples, but not all of the software you need to in install. So what's next is, if you, I don't know how many of you are in the SI line, system integrator line. Does anybody here work in system integrator? A show of hands. Okay, that's one. Okay, so, so the thing is, I went through this project and it's not a simple one. So I would like to share the kind of things that you try to do to make this two environment as close as possible. So what are the AWS services that you can or cannot use? And some of the coping mechanism, the hacks that probably you try your best to reach the difference. Okay, so one thing I wanna go is first is the VPC. Now, Amazon VPC, when you first you know, sign up your account, everything set up for you. The moment you spawn an EC2, the OS, the, the IPs are all given to you automatically. But you don't have that kind of luxury on on-premise servers. So most likely you need to ask your vendors. So do you have a DHCP server? Like when I put it on, will it be assigned? And most of the time, ninety percent to hundred percent say no. They will give you the IPs, and which you have to go into the server and set it the IPs. So to replicate that kind of environment on the AWS you will have to switch off the DHCP on the VPC level. So yeah, it is quite, it's going to be quite troublesome. So, 
So that is one way to actually try to bridge the gap and also try to mirror the IPs. So whatever IPs that you use on premise, try to pull it. Let's say uh, you have a server that give you is 10.168.20.1 to try to put it inside your AWS tool. Okay, EC2. This is definitely the most commonly used service where you are in this kind of project. So you try to mirror one EC2 host to one physical server on-prem or one uh, VMware instance on-prem. All right. But before you actually you know, go ahead first to install, I mean, to, to actually create the EC2s, right? You create the ENI first. Anybody know what's ENI? It stands for the network interface. So at least you think through what does this server purpose serve? Is it a worker? Is it a master node or anything? Depending on the cluster you set up. And also make sure that the host name is reflected on the production. Because every time you set up an EC2, what is the kind of host name you have? Uh, IP something something dot internal if you remember. And sometimes, right, the, the internal host, right, which the customer gives you, may not be this. It can be a host name, just host name. And also, because we, when you're using cloud, you are very used to say, on the first side of travel, you kill off the instance, then you just try to spin a new one to see, to actually speed up your development. Um, try not to do that. Because on the on-premise servers, you do not have luxury to just kill a VM or reinstall a physical server. So you try to troubleshoot if, let's say, it goes down. And you map every single host that you have on USD, every single EC2 that you have on the production. And every single EC2, um, most likely this kind of uh, setup, you use a lot of SSH to go inside and you know, install all the necessary libraries and the software you need. But it will not be sufficient because I encountered a case myself where the EC2, the open SSH server itself, the service itself, it collapsed and you can't SSH in. So my advice is you also try to set up a serial console. So EC2 serial console. So you have the username password way of logging in on the AWS console. And of course, not to say you must replicate every single instance of production on AWS. No need. If let's say you find a way to reduce the number of instances you need on the UAT, by all means, go ahead. Okay, security groups. So you can simulate using this to on the production equivalent that is they have the level two and level three switch. So what is this? So every time you have a rack and you it, and install the servers, right? On top of it, there's a switch. And the switch, right, they have wires plugged in into the rack, into the servers. I'm sorry you had to visualize because I do not have a rack for you. So that is a level two switch. And they will also have a level three switch where they will allow inter-VLAN communication. A VLAN on the production is equivalent to a security group on an EC2. So, Every time you try to actually set up the firewall rules, if possible, you try to map it out into an Excel sheet. Because many times right, on time, they do not have the luxury of a cloud formation. So whatever rules you have, I need this port to open to that port. I need this server to the X server, right? You guys have to open up whatever ports you need and export it out to a CSV then you can actually pass it to your customer to actually implement them. Okay, certificate manager. Um, my colleagues in that project actually tried to use certificate manager in AWS for as a, as a CA, uh, the certificate authority. Unfortunately, this certificate manager service on AWS is not meant for to create the, to sign the cert for you to be used on the, the service that they want to use. So you try to use your self science cert. But if you have services that do not accept self science cert and demands the usage of a certificate authority, then I'm sorry, you have to create an EC2 just to be a certificate authority. 
Okay. Next, uh, directory service. Directory service, um, many on-premise, right, they actually have their own on-site authentication. It's either open your app or AD. I know it's not sound as fanciful as IAM, but uh, they are the customer. So you actually have to sort of work, structure your UAT environment, AWS UAT environment to suit the production. So, yeah, so, but you can use the directory service. Directory service, they have uh, open out there and AD, and you can use that to simulate their production environment. All right. Okay, IAC orchestration tool for this kind of projects is not exactly very useful because uh, there's nothing much to orchestrate on the production. Most of the time, you have to install manual, and many of the Enterprise software that I install is the first 50% of the installation is on command line. Then the next 50% is a web-based installation, which is actually difficult to automate. So you can try to use this tool to unify, but when it comes to the graphic user interface, the web browsers, you'll hear a robot. Okay, now air gap. So, anybody know what's air gap? Or what does it mean? Yeah, it's a favorite term used by the government. It means uh, no connection to the internet. Air gap. So, basically, you want to import any files, right? You need to carry a hard disk, and the hard disk needs to be scanned for any viruses or malware. Then you bring it to the data center. So, so you have to design your... So, if your AWS... Uh, Set up is a UAT, you have to design it to make sure that uh, it's also a gap. Try to simulate the environment. You cannot just put a bastion host on the public subnet and say, okay, it's a air gap. Because for bastion host, you still have to go through the public cloud in. So you must use a VPN, your company VPN, to direct connect to your office infrastructure to actually connect, communicate through. So for this case, if let's say you really, really need air gap, no public subnets around, only private subnets. So, and you put all your instance on private subnets, only private IPs, no private IPs, all right? So for package management, I think, yeah, this is the biggest difficulty I face because a lot of software installation is you do yum install, or they just like, on application level, whether it's Python, you just pull down from public responsibility like PyPy, PYPI, right? But you can't do this. You can't do this kind of thing on the production. So you cannot do the same thing on the UAT. So what are you going to do? So most likely is you have to, you know, Google search, set up your own package servers. It's possible. Uh, or you can actually sort of, like after installation, you run this command if you use Red Hat RPM-QA, it will list down every single package that you have installed on that particular server. And after that, you can take that list, download every single RPM, and then bring the hard disk inside the server and do the installation. Okay, Route 53. Almost every single air gap data centers or non air gap data centers in enterprise. They have their own uh, domain name services. So on the Route 53, you can actually use it as a domain. So it's like you know dot something, dot internal, or whatever, whatever you call it, you can actually put it, you can actually map it to your EC2 instances, or you can map it to your directory instances. So this is uh, one way of working it. So okay, I want to share with you some of the architecture that I designed. So, yeah, I have no uh, presentation to you, but I can show you some architecture design I have. So this is actually an architecture that I have. Uh, this is your office corporate network, and you actually have two gateways. This will ensure that only you can connect through this gateway into it, and all these are actually, as you can see, those are private um, subnets. Uh. All right. 
So you have all the service available. So you have Route 53, you have directory service. You may consider using the certificate manager if you need, but most of the time I realize that it's not much of a use. So this is one architecture you can consider, but this is only for your own use, your own corporate use. What if your customers say, I want to you know, test run the UAT before you actually take the idea and put it on our on-premise production. So I faced this kind of situation before and what I did is I actually created a public subnet just for the customer with load balancer. I avoid using Elastic IP, which is because if you use Elastic IP, you connect it directly to the instance, you will open it up, it will become sort of a security uh, issue, a threat, and it does not simulate an agar environment anymore. So this way of doing it is that you still have an agar environment, and yet you allow the customers to access to your system reading. All right. So let's assume that you do not have the money for your own VPN. A very worst case scenario, your budget is extremely tight. So this is actually the sort of a worst case scenario. So you have no, um, how should I say, you have no VPN or whatever sort to connect. So what happens is you have two private subnets and two private subnets. The subnet what you put is either a Windows host or you can use a AWS workspace. So, so workspace is essentially some kind of like running a virtual desktop interface on the cloud. And from there, you use it as a jump host. You upload your files and you upload your libraries and your keys right into the instances EC2 in the private subnet. They use it as a jump host, but they are not version host. So, uh, made this uh, clarification. And then, of course, you can actually use the IAM to log in for your users to actually like, set up the interface. So, okay, I want to go into project management because this is actually a very new area. So, we actually have a lot of issues and I want to know help you guys, so if let's say you encounter the same problems, help you guys shorten the learning curve. So the idea is, if you are a project manager, um, try to prioritize setting up the UAT and the production environment as close as possible. So you need to communicate with your client, like what kind of uh, authentication service you use, and stuff like that. And of course, because on-prem is not really on the cloud, they will emphasize a lot of hardening. Like, they have their own hardening rules. So any idea, anybody here knows what's hardening? Okay, cool, cool, the same guys. So basically hardening is they take the rules from the CSI playbook and they try to implement rules like, you know, SSH, uh, limitation, or this kind of stuff. So from what we realize is that when you do, do the installation on the production, at the moment you install the OS, uh, you do the hardening first. So that you actually harden your operating system at the smallest attack surface possible. So when you install the applications, when you encounter difficulty, you can look back at where are the hardening rules that cause this problem, and then you compare it to the UAT, and say, okay, I need this to open this port to open, this roof to unharden so that I can actually do the installation. So another point that I realized I need to know is that try to do your UAT setup as much as possible before you go into production. Because if you try to do it in parallel, you will face a difficult situation where you are facing two learning curves. And it will make your project timeline like very tight it will slow down everything. You think that you may have a lot of speed, but actually you just create more haste and then speed. All right? And also, when customers say, okay, after the system set up, I want to do training. Sometimes they may want to do the training on production. 
means that on their own premises instead of your UAT because they know that the environment is different so it's important that you actually sort of clarify this thing up front to the customer uh, I understand that this uh, presentation is a bit unorthodox because most of the time you came from startup environment you like to move fast and break things but unfortunately this kind of project when you talk about setting up uh, on-prem servers this rule does not apply it's going to be slow, it's going to be arduous you've got to dig trenches you know, dugging deep and fight and fight and fight so it's going to be a long and arduous process and yeah I'm not going to take up much of your time, I can go into questions but before that I want to apologize because I'm presenting on a project where AWS is not the production but the UAT in an AWS office so it feels like you know going in the lion's den but yeah I hope you guys understand because uh, it is I mean this kind of situation happens so yeah I open the door for questions anyone has an on-prem pro problem it looks like you work for a government client, right? Uh-huh, okay. Yes, I would, uh, I mean, I work for a government client. Yes, it's true. And you mentioned that production is on the right side, UT is on the right side. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Uh, but the way at least government has this totally different environment. Mm -hmm. And they want UT to be as same as production. How do you handle the percent about uh, yes, uh, it's actually a very difficult thing to answer that. So it depends on case by case basis. So for this uh, project I worked on, the number one uh, issue usually comes in when it comes to hardening or the difference of libraries like that. So yeah, this is a uh, something that usually we will try our best to mitigate by making sure that the environment is as close as possible first the operating system level all right then on the application level are they uh, at the same at the same at the same kind of environment so definitely you must use the same os all right then of course the libraries you install are make sure you must be the same version mm, something like this then of course you can't you still can't avoid situations where uh, I use service in AWS but it's not available in production. So you gotta ask yourself like let's say RDS. You can use RDS in uh, in the AWS, but unfortunately when it comes to production, you won't have to use RDS. And the way they set up customize the SQL let's say you use my SQL, the way you AWS set up MySQL on for them, right? It will be very different from the production. So you have to figure out what kind of settings, minor settings that you, you will need to use. Yes, yeah, something like this. So when you are on, on prem, you are using some kind of solution like VMware or OpenStack. So you can install those on AWS and have much closer environments, right? Or, or maybe, uh, how, how does your on-premise look like? Are those like bare metal servers? Okay, we have uh, some that are on bare metal servers and some that are on uh, VMware. So it complicates things. But uh, we did try with a little bit, with a little bit limited success that we can actually, we can actually export the there's a way to actually export the instant image from AWS to put it on production because there's a collaboration with AWS and VMware. You can actually export image out. Unfortunately, uh, you still have to go through the trouble of hardening. So if you actually did not harden on the UAT, you will face pro pro problems on the production. So you need to keep in mind about that. So how do you handle the CI CD aspect of 
Okay, the thing is, this is on the OS and I mean on the physical and OS level. Then after that, application. So the the CI/CD is actually not applicable. It's only applicable on the application itself. Like one of the CI/CD tools they use is GitLab. So there's no chance for you to use Copilot on production. No chance at all. Yeah. All right. I guess there's nothing else. Um, so just one, one last question. How do you do the comments? Pardon? How, how do you do the comments? Congratulations across two very different rounds. Honestly, uh, there is, I can tell you there's no recognition at all. No recognition. So forget about it. It's, uh, you really need to sort of like have a good uh, tester, a uh, unit test, uh, somebody who tests the system to do the SIT. So the SIT need to have a list of uh, tests that you want to do. Where it works on UAT and try to see whether it works in production. There's no way, I can tell you, there's no way to record like, like yourself. Fully, I mean fully. In terms of the sense, yeah.